Only a few miles from the dark swamps are these pristine beaches and, and the bustling boardwalks of the South Carolina coast. Myrtle Beach is about 75 miles of beach, white sandy beaches, very coastal, low-lying areas, a lot of swamps and rivers uh, and intercoastal waterway connected. We have everything you'd want in a vacation destination. We've got the beach, we've got activities, we've got shows, we've got a lot of golf and tennis. We get 20 million tourists a year. We get a lot of transplants from the New York area, New Jersey, and then we have locals as well who have been born and raised here. The actual permanent population of Myrtle Beach is more like around 30,000. So this is still a really small town. Conway, I think it catches a lot of people off guard. I think they think Myrtle Beach is kind of all that's here. I call it small town USA. It's a nice little three block downtown. Everything's kind of that red brick that you picture when you drive in. And it's just got a slower feel than Myrtle Beach. When I first came down to Myrtle Beach to report on this story, one of the things that I noticed first was this great divide between the tourists who live on the coast and the locals who live west of the intercoastal inland. And it was there that in December of 2013, a young woman, just 20 years old, Heather Elvis, disappears. When people talk about Heather, they smile because she was so full of personality. She lit up a room when she walked in. She was precious. She had a wonderful life. She had a beautiful life. She lived it the way she wanted. She made her choices the way she wanted. We've always been a, a tight-knit family. Everybody does for everybody else. I would describe Heather as outgoing, free spirit, you know, love and life. She always wanted to live life to the fullest. She loved to make up. She wanted to be in front of the camera and behind the camera and design everything that she wore in front of the camera. She didn't understand boundaries when it came to dreaming. Heather Elvis worked at a restaurant, a sports bar here called the Tilted Kilt. Tilted Kilt is an Irish-Scottish version of Hooters. So the girls wear kilts. It's like a sports bar, so they have TVs everywhere. They have a whole bunch of different beers on tap. Heather was a hostess at Tilted Kilt, where I was a manager. She was friendly to everybody. She's always smiling. She had a contagious laugh that I would love to hear again. Heather and I worked at Tilted Kilt together. Um, I actually helped her get that job. I talked to the managers and said they should bring her on, that she's a really great young woman. and that she definitely, she'd be a great addition to the team. It wasn't the most appropriate of uniforms, but at that age, you do what you can to rebel against your parents. <laughs> Heather really didn't give a crap what anybody thought about her. Huh. She was a very free spirit, and she expressed herself how she wanted to, and she might have come off abrasive to some people, but she was just, she was very real. It's and funny because she looks like such a kid in those pictures. <laughs> she, she looked like she such was tiny. a young... She was tiny. She was tiny. She was just 20 like, years I, old, and I she looked I feel like young. I'm a short woman, but she, <laughs> she made me feel tall. She yeah. was very tiny. And yet, there was a big personality Very big personality. That. When you're young in Myrtle Beach, you don't think <clears throat> that bad things are going to happen. It came out of the blue. No one expected this to happen. But at about 4 a.m. on December 18th, that early morning, an Horry County police officer was on a routine patrol when he noticed that empty car in the parking lot. He got out because it was suspicious that there's a car there this time of night. There's no lights. There's nobody around. He gets out, he checks the vehicle. There doesn't appear to be anything out of the normal, so he then gets back and continues patrolling. The next day, someone reported that car as a suspicious vehicle because of the length of time it had been sitting at Peachtree Boat Landing. At that time, Officer Canterbury goes down and sees the car, runs the tag. When he runs the tag, he finds it belonged to Terry Elvis. I think I was sitting in the living room and I 
had a knock at the door. And Debbie went to the door. And I, I saw through the window that it was uh, a county police officer. And uh, he was asking if we were missing a car. And I remember both of us looking in the driveway. Like, no. And he says, uh, a green Dodge Intrepid. Oh, yeah, that's Heather's car. And then he goes on to explain that it's been found uh, at Peachtree Landing, apparently abandoned. He asked if I had keys to it, and I said, yeah. He said, let's ride down and take a look. By the time we got there, it was dark. And uh, he pulled in, had his lights on the back of the car, and shined his spotlight on it. He says, that is? I said, yeah. So we got out to go take a look. Mr. Elvis uh, immediately suspected something was wrong. He knew that that was his daughter's only mode of transportation. It had no business being at that landing. She never went to that landing. I was just sitting there twiddling my thumbs and waiting, calling Heather's phone. It was going straight to voicemail, which is way out of character with Heather. I thought the car might have been stolen because of the way it was parked. Maybe somebody took it and left it there. It really didn't hit me. Where's Heather? Uh, until he started looking through things. Clothes, art, shoes, purses, makeup, you name it, was in her car. But they don't find her phone. They don't find her wallet. They don't find a pocketbook. I could see the worry on his face. Uh, that's when I, I got worried. After we looked inside the car, he says, uh, let's look in the trunk. And I think even though I still thought the car was stolen, I, I could feel my heart just drop. Lows tonight near 40 inland will be in the mid 40s right along the immediate coast. First, I thought the car was stolen, and now we're opening the trunk. Well, I was panicking and pacing the floor while he was at the landing. So I put the key in and turn it and open the trunk, and I look away. Heather's phone is an extension of herself and it was always in her hand or very close by, and for her not to answer the phone wasn't right. And he said, it's just stuff, and it was. We closed the trunk back, and uh, he looks around the perimeter of the landing. He walks around the edge, just looking into the woods and along the edge to see if there's anything out of place. And everything looked like normal. When they got back to Mr. Elvis's house, he knew how to access the phone records for the family. While Heather lived on her own, she was still very dependent on her father. Um, she was on his phone plan still. She still drove his vehicle, so he had access to these things. He was able to produce those records for Officer Canterbury. My panic had really set in because it's totally out of the ordinary. You know, Heather's never done anything like this before. Something's wrong, but what's wrong? That's when police began piecing together the last known movements of Heather on the night she disappeared. So, December 17th, Heather went on a date with Steve Schiraldi. Like Heather, 21-year-old Stephen Schiraldi was active on social media, posting selfies and chatting with friends. It was actually on Instagram that he connected with Heather. Stephen and Heather had gone to high school together. <laughs> And I believe Stephen asked her out on a date, and she agreed to go. She was looking forward to that date very much. Stephen says they went to dinner at a place called Bandito's. After dinner, they went to an abandoned parking lot at a shopping mall, where Stephen taught Heather how to drive a stick shift truck. We were watching TV, and I got a text. And uh, it was a picture of Heather driving uh, a small pickup truck. A big smile on her face. 
It was a picture of her driving Steve's truck. It was below what she had written, learn to drive a stick. Ha, ha, ha. Because it was a sore point. Uh, I had tried to teach her how to drive a stick shift. You're proud and aggravated at the same time. Yeah, but yeah, it, was, it was pride. Heather went to Stephen's house briefly to watch a movie. His mother corroborates that. And then Stephen took her home. He said he took her back to the apartment, dropped her off, and went home, and said that they'd either text or talked, you know, after that a couple of times for a few minutes. Police across the country know that in any missing persons case, the first 48 hours are absolutely critical. Right now, they're leaving no stone unturned. And as part of this initial investigation, they send an officer over to the tilted kilt to see if Heather had missed work. One of the first things that investigators hear from Heather's co-workers is that there is a different man who they should be talking to, other than the man Heather went on a date with the night before. The manager said she's not working until tomorrow, but you really need to call Sydney Moore. There had been a relationship between the two of them. Sydney Moore, back in 2013, was a night maintenance man at various miscellaneous restaurants along the Grand Strand, one of which being the Tilted Kilt, which is where he met Heather Elvis. Heather and Sydney started talking. They noticed each other when he would start doing little things around Tilted Kilt. She noticed that, you know, he was good looking, he had a good attitude, and she, she went for it. Now, he may have been good looking, but he was 37, which made him 17 years older than Heather Elvis. Sydney and Heather's relationship was certainly sexual in nature. I think that was a big driving force in that relationship. Sydney and Heather were having sex all the time, anywhere that they could. There were allegations that there was sex in the restaurant nearby during work hours, everything else. That did not make me happy whatsoever. So I did ask her about it. I confronted her about it. What was the actual nature of their relationship? I mean, most people would call it a sexual relationship, but from my opinion of talking to her, they were in love. How long was it before that everybody knew that they were an item? Uh, I want to say it, it was probably like the end of summer, early August, maybe. Having known Heather since we were little, it was a little surprising. But Heather was always a risk taker. She was pretty rebellious. She was one of those people when you told her no, it only wanted to make her do it more. She always wanted what made her happy. So I guess Sydney just made her happy when they were together. And like so many other people Heather's age, she shared her thoughts and her musings on social media, whether she was happy or sad. And she did so pretty frequently. I think for any 20 year old, there's a strong uh, social media presence and used it for everything. And that's their main form of communication. They're on Twitter, they're on Facebook, and there's not a great filter there. Heather did enjoy social media, and I think that that was one place where she could express herself openly and wouldn't be judged for it. There's no telling what would come out of that girl's mouth. <laughs> she uh, she posted a lot of a lot of off the wall things, you know, at random times of the day. Sydney would sometimes come to bring her coffee and bagels, not to do a job, but literally just to bring her something. Yes. Did you find that charming? It was cute, even though we all thought that it was wrong <laughs> on so many levels. I knew that she was talking to a boy named Sydney, uh, that he was sweet and she was smitten. <laughs> I had no idea he was married. I'm your nightmare while you're fast asleep. Heather received a phone call, and it was Tammy on the other end, and she said, I know you're with my husband. And revenge has never felt so sweet. At this point, Heather was missing, and they don't really know where she's at. However, they do know that she was having an affair with a married man who also worked at the Tilted Kilt by the name of Sidney Moore. Being bad has never felt so cool. We learned all about it in just that first little short period of time because everybody who wanted to help told us everything, more than we wanted to know, really. I'm gonna do bad things. You 
When you're in love, you're in love. When you're 20, you don't always necessarily think through all of those things. Doing bad things to you. Cindy Moore was 37 years old, he had three kids, and he was married to a 40-year-old woman named Tammy. She was nearly twice Heather's age. Tammy and Sydney Moore were married over 15 years. When I got involved in this case, they had a son that was around 15, a daughter that was around 13, and another son that was around 10 or 11. Tammy Moore was definitely the more domineering part of that couple. She told Sydney where to work, when to work, what to do. Uh, if I would classify Sydney as anything in that relationship, it would be utterly submissive. They both had jobs at night, or they worked at night. They would sleep during the day. They were homeschooling their children. So literally, you could live in Myrtle Beach and never even run across these people. Prior to this affair, Sydney did have another previous affair. I think Tammy, being the domineering person she was, always was suspicious of Sydney, especially after the first affair he got caught having. It wasn't a secret to those that worked at the kill. Um, you know, we all knew about it. The affair between Sydney Moore and Heather Elvis was the worst kept secret in Horry County. By now, Heather's relationship with Sydney had been going on for about three months. And there were lots of folks who worked at the Tilted Kilt with her who felt that this relationship had just crossed the line. There were definitely people that we worked with at the Tilted Kilt that did not agree with Sydney and Heather's relationship. One day, two of the girls decided to call the Tilted Kilt and pretend to be Tammy, Sydney's wife. I don't know if they were jealous, if they were upset that she was dating a married man. They decided to make a pregnant phone call and said, this is Tammy Moore. I know about you and my husband. I need you to stop right now. And when Heather got that phone call, she totally freaked out. After that prank call, coworkers say that they didn't see Sydney coming around Heather anymore. Then by the end of October 2013, Sydney and Heather's relationship completely unraveled when Tammy found out for real this time about their affair. And it's at this point that Tammy confronted Heather. Heather received a phone call, and it was Tammy on the other end, and she said, I know you're with my husband, essentially. Like, I know you've been sleeping with my husband. Sydney got on the phone and said, you were just some girl that spread your legs. He pretty much belittled Heather and made it seem like it was nothing, and that he just used her for a booty call. Heather was crying because they broke up, and she was very upset about it. After Tammy found out about the affair, she was absolutely livid. She did um, call Heather a lot, text Heather a lot. Someone's about to get their beat down. She was posting a lot of disparaging comments on social media, and Heather was legitimately terrified. You can tell me who you are right now, or I will find out another way. Nobody you need to worry about anymore. And what did they say, do you remember? Oh, she was threatening her. Hey, sweetie, you ready to meet the missus? Basically just letting her know that she was there and she knew. And what did she say? Are you ready to meet the missus? That doesn't sound that bad. Well, she did mention something about Sydney taking his last breath. Your bitch is about to take his last breath. And Tammy was relentless. She would call her nonstop for hours and hours and hours. She would call off Sydney's phone. The breakup between the two of them was nasty. It didn't go down well. Um, it ended with threats. I'm giving you one last chance to answer before we meet in person. Only one. She was sending pictures of her and Sydney performing sexual acts, videos of you know the two of them together, I guess kind of to taunt Heather. Heather didn't shy away from responding. I think you're a little obsessed with me. <laughs> nah, it was a bore. She, I don't want to say, Push Tammy's buttons, but certainly didn't just brush it off. Really? So that's why you're still childishly texting me from your cheating husband's phone? Your skank needs to leave me alone. Were you concerned for Heather, or was Heather concerned after those text messages came in? Heather was definitely freaked out. I think she was terrified of her. I mean, her her demeanor completely changed over the next few weeks. Like she was, she was very paranoid.
Heather was genuinely scared. Like she didn't want to ever see Tammy. In September 2013, Heather wrote on her Twitter page, once upon a time, an angel and a devil fell in love and it did not end well. She probably was referring to her in Sydney. Heather just kept saying, leave me alone. Leave me alone, I don't want anything to do with this. And the calls did stop. Finally, they did stop. Once Tammy finds out about this affair, the Moors take a road trip all the way out to California. But this is after purchasing a brand new black F-150. It was a three week trip. So it was a lot of time together. They drove all the way to California and drove back. According to the Moors, the purpose of the trip was to reconcile their marriage. Heather was heartbroken. It took a few weeks for Heather to kind of come back around to become that bubbly type person. Heather started coming back to her normal self, always joking, always laughing, giggling, pulling pranks on people, the Heather that we've always known and loved before October. By the beginning of December, there was no communication between Heather and the Moors. Heather was really looking forward to her future after putting everything to rest with Sydney. By all accounts, Heather had moved on. She was dating again. In fact, on the night she disappeared, she was out on a date with someone new. But now, Heather was gone and gone without a trace. And police went to the Tilted Kilt, and that's where they were tipped off about Heather's affair with Sidney Moore. So the police immediately go to Sidney's house. They talk with him in December 20th, early morning, I'd say 2 a.m. Yes. When's the last night? Um, either last night or night before, I can't remember. And what's your relationship with her? There is no relationship. There was a relationship. I broke it off. So he was trying to give the police this idea of, look, I'm over her. I haven't reached out to her. I don't know where she is. I've had zero contact with her. At any point, did you go down around the Peachtree Landing there? No. So there's nothing that's going to show up? Is there anything you want to say if she happens to be watching right now? Heather, if you're watching this, if you can see it, if you can hear it, we miss you. But we want you home. Tell me where you're at. Oh, come. It doesn't, <clears throat> doesn't matter where, doesn't matter when, doesn't matter why. Just tell us where you're at. We begin tonight with a developing story in Horry County as a 20-year-old Sagasti woman is missing. I'm Allison Floyd. And I'm Tim McGinnis. Tonight, police are investigating her disappearance. WPDE News Channel 15's Kayla Dorenzo joins us live from Peachtree Landing in Sagasti, where the woman's car was found. And Kayla, what's been going on out there all day? Tim and Allison, according to the Horry County Police Department, Heather Elvis's car was found in this parking lot here at Peachtree Landing on Thursday, but she hasn't been seen in nearly three days. And today, crews were out here searching for any any signs that may point to exactly where she is. Originally, this case was just assigned out as a missing person. We did not know or have any reason to believe a crime had been committed in the beginning. The car showed no sign of a struggle. There was no blood, no broken glass, nothing to believe that a crime had been committed. Detectives are continuing to investigate the situation. So while crews were searching for any physical trace of Heather at Peachtree Landing, police were combing through her phone records. And almost immediately, they noticed an unusual number of calls to an unfamiliar number. They then found out the number belonged to a payphone. And that the payphone had called her phone that very early hour of 1.35 AM. And then she immediately is calling the payphone back. Heather dials that payphone back nine times. Not eight, but nine times. 
The only reason she could possibly be calling that phone nine times that she's never heard of before is to get the other person that just talked to her back on the line. They find that the payphone has surveillance video. They pulled the surveillance video. It was very grainy. You see an individual walk to the payphone. He's on the payphone over five minutes. Even though they didn't know who it was, they had evidence then that the payphone had been used. They call Sidney Moore back. They bring him into the police station for a more formal interview. Ord County Police begin questioning Sidney about his whereabouts on December 18th, and he tells them that he and his wife Tammy were going around doing errands. And at one point, they stopped at a Walmart. Was that Walmart actually? In Myrtle Beach. Myrtle Beach Walmart. Yeah. Was your wife with you yes. the whole time? Yeah, she was with me the whole time. They asked him about the pay phone call. Had you used any other phones that night? Your wife's phone? No. Did you make any pay phone calls? Nope. I still have pay phones. Who makes a phone call today from a pay phone? Sydney Moore has a cell phone. Tammy Moore has a cell phone. And Tammy Moore used that cell phone to great length to harass and essentially stalk Heather Ellis. They were calling from a pay phone to hide the call. There was a phone call made to Heather that night from a pay phone at the gas station on 10th Avenue. Okay. But we have video from that. Okay. Did you try calling her just a minute? No. A second? You sure? Maybe. Okay, how about we start again? I, I did. I called her from okay, the pay phone. What did you say? I asked her to please leave me alone. It sounded like a very innocent explanation, but Heather's roommate, Brianna, tells police a very different account of that phone call. At 1.44 in the morning, she called me. I was on winter break from college in Florida. She was hysterically crying, and she said, Sydney called. My heart dropped because I was like, I thought we were past this. I said, why'd you answer? And she said, because it wasn't his number. She told me that he said he left his wife and that he was sorry and that he wanted to see her and be with her. And I told her, don't do it. Why don't you go to sleep, sleep on this and we'll talk about it first thing in the morning. When Heather and I hung up that night, by the end of the phone call, I was under the assumption that she wasn't going to meet Sydney. That's when everything starts moving in a very different direction. After interviewing Heather's roommate, Brianna, about that conversation that Sydney and Heather had on the payphone, police begin by reconstructing the movements of Tammy and Sydney that night. They begin by pulling security video from that Walmart in Myrtle Beach. Sydney spent approximately nine minutes inside that Walmart, then went and got back in the truck where Tammy was waiting outside. After that, they drove directly to the payphone where you see Sydney make the call to Heather Ellis. Day 20 in the search for missing 20-year-old Heather Elvis. Dozens of cars and horse trailers line the heavily wooded area. While teams of volunteers continue to search for any trace of Heather, police are now squarely putting the focus of their investigation on Sydney and Tammy. But rather than lend a hand in the search, Sydney and Tammy unleash an online tirade against the missing 20-year-old. The Moore's big push was to basically discourage anybody that was looking for Heather Elvis. They had a lot of negative things to say about the victim. Tammy and Sydney Moore were vicious at times on social media. I mean, Tammy Moore put out a Facebook post shortly after she went missing, calling her a whore, saying these terrible things. We've all heard the term a woman scorned, right? And that's Tammy Moore was. She, but when you see these posts and you see the way she's behaving as an adult woman, a mother with three kids, the way she's hounding this 20-year-old kid, it's disturbing. It was a social media war a campaign of pure terror. This case was the perfect storm for two families that were very outspoken, very motivated, and they weren't going to give up either side. Using Heather's phone records and her Gmail account, investigators begin to piece together her movements. 
After that phone call from Sydney at 1.35 a.m., Heather ends up calling his cell phone several times between 3.17 a.m. and 3.21 a.m. Finally, he picks up and the two have a conversation for about four minutes. And it's at that point that Heather gets in her car and begins driving. We trace Heather's phone all the way to Peachtree Boat Landing. And once she gets to the landing, she's again calling Sydney Moore. 337, 338, 339, 340. It was your four phone calls right in a row. This is why this is important, because while Heather was making those phone calls, video surveillance cameras along the route to Peach Tree Landing also show a black pickup headed in the same direction. Right there is the camera that caught what the FBI and the prosecutors say is that Ford F-150 going south towards Peachtree Landing. At 3.41 a.m. is when Heather's cell phone goes dead. There's nothing else at the end of that road but Peachtree Landing and Heather Elvis. I think any time you have a missing person, the pressure on law enforcement is immense. Not so much from the community, but you have a family that's missing a daughter, and they wanted to find her. We had the payphone call, which still wasn't enough. Then we kind of had to chase down what Sydney Moore told the police to find out what was true and what wasn't true. During this time frame, we also started beginning looking for surveillance footage along 814 and Mill Pond Road. When you look at a map, it's immediately clear that driving Highway 814 and Mill Pond Road is the quickest way connecting Peach Tree Landing and Tammy and Sydney Moore's house. In fact, they're only four miles apart. So right up here is a surveillance camera that captured the image of a truck that looked very much like the one owned by Sydney and Tammy Moore driving towards Peach Tree Landing. There's nothing else at the end of that road but Peach Tree Boat Landing and Heather Elvis. Heather's phone dies, and then you see the truck immediately coming back across the same two cameras, heading back to the Moore's residence. So assuming that whoever was doing this was roughly driving the speed limit, they only had about 60 seconds at Peach Tree Landing to do whatever they were going to do and get back on this road in time to be captured by those surveillance cameras at 3.45 a.m. At the time, Sydney Moore and Tammy Moore own a 2014 Ford 150 truck. Horry County Police Department found there was only one, and it was Sydney Moore, who also happened to be the only person that lived that close to the landing owning that truck. Once investigators discovered that apparent link between Heather's disappearance and Tammy and Sydney Moore, they pay a visit to their house. Originally, when the officer showed up at Tammy and Sydney Moore's house on December 20th of 2013, they noticed that there were cameras up outside the house. The goal after they saw that security system was to get a search warrant. However, once they went back, they found out that the surveillance system in there was a new system and that it had not recorded anything on December 18th of 2013. They had no idea what was on the new system, but they knew that they, out of an abundance of caution, they needed to seize that system. Investigators also scoured the Moore's black pickup truck looking for clues, and they made an important discovery. It was a brand new F-150, fully loaded, had all the bells and whistles. In this truck was a GPS navigation system. We learned that it was possible to disengage this system, and that's exactly what they did. And it's like a camera SIM card. You push down, it'll pop out. When you take it out, warnings will show up all over your vehicle. So it could not have been a mistake. It had only been taken out once, and that was the night she went missing. Two months later, the police arrested Sidney Moore and Tammy Moore. They told us that morning that they were going to do it. They actually had uh, officers come and sit with us at home. Uh, to make sure that we were there and we were protected and we knew what was going on. Sydney Moore and Tammy Moore were the two people that were taken into custody earlier this morning. The breakthrough in the case came from a discovery made by Elvis's father. He says after he looked up her cell phone records. 
That number, the parents telling ABC News, belonged to 38-year-old Sydney Moore. It was a relief to know that something was getting started. We're going to begin with a break in the case of a young woman who simply vanished. Two people have been taken into custody. Both Sydney and Tammy Moore are being held here at the J. Reuben Long Detention Center. Immediately in this case, the defendants, the victims, everyone went to social media. It was like wildfire. It spread exponentially in, in a matter of hours. What began as a case dividing two families who lived just five miles apart quickly consumed the entire town. At this point, it seemed like everyone had an opinion. It seemed the whole town took sides. This was probably the first case where the social media took on a life of its own. I don't think anybody had seen anything like this case. I never experienced anything like it, where there were so many so-called facts that came from somewhere, but did not come from a police investigation. The state asked for and the judge granted them a gag order. The order prohibits all parties, including defendants, prosecutors, and law enforcement agencies from speaking to the media. And because of the severity of the alleged crime, Tammy and Sidney Moore were denied bail and sent to jail for almost 12 months. We then had another bond hearing in February of 2015. At that time, Judge Dennis decided to allow them to be out on an ankle monitor. It was just a very traumatic time, so it, we were in a fog. Prosecutors decided to try Sydney and Tammy separately. So Sydney goes on trial first in 2016 for the kidnapping of Heather Elvis. Now, prosecutors are not required to show motive when they try a case, but they do understand that motive often helps juries understand the background and what's really going on. And in this particular case, the prosecutors were not going to disappoint that jury. In the weeks before Heather Elvis goes missing, she puts on noticeable weight. A fellow co-worker at the Tilted Kilt, which provides the uniforms to the employees, mentions that her bra size goes up. She went from an A cup bra to a B cup bra than a B to a C. I mean, that's the kind of thing that typically happens when someone is pregnant. Yes, definitely. And remember that errand that Sydney ran at the Walmart the night Heather disappeared? He made two purchases, and he paid in cash. The motive was absolutely that Heather was pregnant. I think she was carrying his child, and she wanted to be with him. If she is pregnant with Sydney's child, that changes everything.